one. Good evening and welcome. Um, I am delighted to say this evening we are live and cooking with Yota Motolenghi. And tonight Yotam is cooking an amazing recipe. <laughs> Thank you, Ollie. His, his new cookbook, which I'm sure you all have. Simple. Um, we're here. Tonight we're going to cook chili fish with tahini. Um, and I'm going to try and answer a few questions and ask yeah. a few questions and you can fire in things. And so hopefully we'll learn something. We'll have fun. But thank you, Yotam, yeah. for joining us. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, so shall I tell you what tell us what we're cooking. On? So we're cooking a chili fish. So um, uh, this recipe had um, three types of chilies. Now it's got only two types of chilies. So I'm using some fresh red chilies and some ancho chili. And, this is uh, a simple philosophy, you cut from three to two. <laughs> yeah, kind of from three to two, but actually everything has been, is being made to make your life so much easier when you cook this. So you still have an element of surprise, yeah. uh, in the sense that you know, people have come to expect something a bit unusual with me and my, and my food. Uh, so the, all that will be here with the depth of the ancho chili. I'm using caraway seeds, right. which are uh, people don't really asso so, so associate so much with fish and, you know, and tomatoes, etc. But it's a really great North African way of cooking fish with tomato and caraway seeds. So in places like um, Libya, and Egypt, etc. These combinations they exist, uh, but you can make the whole uh, of the sauce in advance. You can, in, fa in fact, you can actually du double it or quadruple it and just cook your fish in it because the fish doesn't take any time to cook. Yeah, you talk in the restaurant about the fact that you actually make the sauce, you double it up, and then freeze it. Yes, and then right. freeze it or chill it, and then you use it, and then you've got it all there in the fridge. And this is one of the things that I talk quite a lot about in this book. It's about so the easy cooking is not necessarily about um, things that take five minutes to cook. Yep. It, often it's about what you can make ahead. So you can make a whole so sauce ahead of time, have it ready, and then when it's time to cook, you just put it in there and it's, it's ready to, to go. Awesome. Listen, I'm going to fire a few questions while you're Yeah, go away. for it. So um, the first question we had in was from Liz Rennie, um, who said, where do you find the inspiration for your dishes? Uh, so I'm a really lucky man. I've got restaurants yeah. and I've got chefs working with me and I, l much of my inspiration, comes, my inspiration comes from people that I work with. Yeah. So I'm always the first person to give credit to all those wonderful people that I work with. So, you know, chefs from, from around the world, the world? from yeah. the, all over the yeah. world, you know, they could be Spanish, they could be Korean, they could be um, South American. And these are always great source, sources for inspiration. I'm the first person to kind of go, okay, tell me something that I don't know, you know, teach me something new. And all these people, you know, we have great, uh, I've got a test kitchen, you came to yeah. see me, Ollie, yeah. uh, in an arch, yeah. railway arch in Camden, here in North London. And uh, we cook. And when we cook, ideas come up and, and conversations are sparked. And every person brings their own story, their own uh, background. And that's how you get really good food. So I'm really lucky to be surrounded by very you know, creative people from all over the world. So we have conversations and things yeah. come up. Yeah. We're lucky in London, aren't we? We've got that kind of amazing. We really are really lucky. And, and it does make a massive difference. Uh, so I'll just tell you, Ollie, what we've yeah. got here. So I've got, um, I've been. Um, browning uh, some garlic and uh, fresh chili, some ancho chili, you know, beautiful and smoky, yeah. not, too st not too spicy, and some caraway seeds. And now that things have gotten a little bit of color, a little bit of flavor, I'm going to add some fresh tomatoes. I mean, tomatoes are not the best at the moment because it's kind of the end of the season. Uh, I'm adding a little bit of uh, tomato paste. And you know, whether you add tomato paste or not, it will depend quite a lot on the, on the nature of your tomatoes and how If you were out of season, would you, would you say you could do this with tin tomatoes as well? Or yeah, um, you you could do this with tin tomatoes, but I prefer for this particular one not to do tin tomatoes. The reason being is this is, um, the tin tomatoes are, they have a deeper flavor, they're a bit, and they kind of overwhelm the fish a bit for me. So I like to use fresh tomatoes for this. Someone's calling us. There we go. You see, people are so keen to see this on Facebook, they're actually now turning up outside and joining us, which is great. This, <laughs> Don't this say that because people this are going to start this is the actually no going to arrive where our here. Offices are. This is ultimately the joy of, um, of live TVs. You never quite know what's going to happen, particularly yeah. when you're in the sort of. I think, you know, I think uh, that this. They really are I keen think to the be. Out. The they're story's out. The story's out. They know where our office is and they've come to find it. So, I'm, um, just to recap here, so I've got everything here now. I added my tomato, tomato paste. A pinch of sugar here as well because, I, like I said, the tomatoes are not that great at the moment. And then we're just cooking that down. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, let's move to our second question. So a question from um, Russell Barrett. He said, what's the most memorable or favorite recipe you have cooked? Uh, it's a really tricky one. I mean, 
I cook, you know, I, I, at the, I don't cook in my restaurants anymore. I haven't done that for many years, but I cook a lot in my test kitchen or I'm surrounded by people who cook. And one of the dishes that we cooked over and over again uh, was for my, not the last book, the one before it was, was Nopi. And it's a pastilla, you know, a Moroccan pastilla. So it's a, it's a, it's a chicken or, or rabbit uh, pie. And, and uh, we use chicken, but it's got so many elements. There's uh, scrambled eggs, there's like uh, meat that you slow cook and then shred. Uh, then when you finish it off, you put, um, you put uh, powdered sugar on top and you, you, and you make, uh, you kind of blow torch it to get a kind of almost a caramel on top. And that was a kind of an epic dish. And <coughs> we cooked it, you know, many times and it was, you know, pretty, uh, you know, lengthy, but it was a great fun and a great recipe. And, this is like the opposite of this cooking, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's like some if you take if you look at it, it's the yeah. spectrum, you know, like that's weekend cooking. You take on a real a real challenge, and you uh, that's great fun. But in this book, it's kind of the exact opposite. It's things that are quick and easy, and things that you can do. So we I, I divided the book into different categories, and each recipe gets uh, gets uh, it belongs to at least one category of simple cooking. It could be something that you cook within half an hour. That's the S short on time. Yeah. The I is ingredients, 10 or less. The M is the make ahead that we talked yeah. about. P is pantry. Yeah. So those are recipes that you can really kind of put together from stuff you've got in your, yeah. in your pantry. All those are rice, couscous, yeah. uh, pasta dishes, quick and easy. Uh, and then uh, L is lazy. Yeah. I'm not saying anyone's lazy. It's lazy in the sense that... We all uh, need lazy cooking at times. We, we all e need lazy cooking sometimes. And um, it's lazy in the sense that... Um, it's something that you just put in a tray or on your stovetop and forget about it for a couple of hours. You know, stews and roasts and things that are so delicious and everybody just loves eating. Yeah. Uh, those are the lazy ones. And E, that's the last one, simple, yeah. easier than you think. Yeah. And uh, those, <coughs> excuse me, that's the chili. Um, and those are uh, recipes that people tend to shy away from certain recipes, mm -hmm. like something like bread baking yeah. or ice cream making if yeah. you don't have a, an ice cream machine or things that sound really French, yeah. you know, like confit. Yeah. And uh, so those are kind of funny recipes like that. So we, I've, but in actual fact, they're easier than, than you think they are. And we've got, I've got a bunch of recipes here that people would maybe not cook if you didn't kind of prop them. Yeah. But actually, if once they did, they go like, oh, actually, that is but that's really easy. easy. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So that's the system in the book. Excellent. Well, listen, I've got another question here from Kyle ask, Warhol. Ask away. Um, so what's your, you've got two chilies in here. What is your favorite type of chili? And how do you find if it's too spicy when you add it to a recipe? How do you temper the heat? Because yeah. occasionally one adds it and one's like, wow, actually. Yeah. So chili done? is, uh, I, I don't have a favorite. I use a lot of Aleppo and Urfa chilies, which are Middle Eastern variety of chilies. And um, the Urfa chili is a bit like, like ancho. It's mm -hmm. small. They come in flakes. So you can actually talking about how much you add you add them, you know a quarter of a teaspoon at a time or half a teaspoon yeah. So that's how you make sure you don't add too much and They're really 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 fantastic chilies to work with and they add a lot of um, Color and character to a dish. Yeah. What I love doing is take heating up some oil or butter and Throwing those flaked chilies either Urfa or Aleppo. Aleppo is a little bit hotter, but still mm -hmm. quite nice and aromatic and and kind of flavoring and coloring the oil or the butter with, with those chilies so they turn mm. red, they're beautiful. It's yeah. a Turkish way of heat, uh, cooking chilies. And then I spoon that on top of soups and stews yeah. and anything, really yeah. almost anything that's served warm. And it's absolutely de delicious. So those two I really love. But I also like uh, Mexican chilies, uh, like ancho, like cascabel chili, which you can actually get nowadays in the UK quite easily in supermarkets. Yeah. Uh, that's another one of the relatively mild, but more nutty, earthy yeah. tasting chilies. So, I mean, you just start, and yeah. what you There's do if you heat, if you just to answer, to answer the question about what you do if, if it's heated, too hot. Yeah. Um, so there's certain, certain coolants, so yogurt really helps. Yep. Some chopped parsley sometimes help, helps yep. a little bit, I find, but it's a little bit like salt. It's very hard to reverse, so you just need to kind of halve it and start yeah. fresh. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and learn uh, on recipes how much is the, you know. That's what you do. I have to say, I, I get sad if I haven't eaten enough chili. Um, Are okay. you a chili head? I am a chili head. I think it's a, a great thing. Now, a great question here from John Harlow. John Harlow, who's one of the people who certainly cooks most from our cookbook club. So he says, I'm a new fan of yours, the result of Simple. 
When you wrote this book, who did you have in mind? Because he's actually ordered a whole bunch of copies for Christmas. So thank you, John. For I, I, had, copies. I had his family in mind. His family yeah, in mind. Yeah, John's family in mind. Excellent. Yeah. This is perfect. And he thought it was a book that actually was really good for people who'd fallen out of love with cooking mm -hmm. and actually would get them back into the simplicity of it. Yeah. That uh, was John's view of it. What's your view? Of who, was, who were you thinking about when you wrote it? Um, so, actually, I'll tell you a secret. I was thinking about my sister. Right. Because my sister always said to me, you know what, I love you so much, my dear brother, but I'll never cook your food <laughs> because it's just too complicated for me. My life is too short. I've got three kids. I've got a job to, uh, to go to every day. I just don't have time for this faffing. Because there is this joke that, you know, like for an Otolenghi recipe, you need two days to, to shop, two days to cook, and two days to wash up, which I kind of all fess on sometimes, but not always. Uh, so people like my sister that are very busy, and they don't want, always want to cook for occasions, so they yeah. come home and they have these, you know, this half an hour, an hour to cook. They are one kind of people. The other ones is the people that love the idea of, to, you know, I, I just want, I've got a kind of a more of a thought. It's like, you know, cooking, people who are feeling anxious about cooking often is an unjustified anxiety because they don't know how to prepare themselves, mm. what to do. They, f they cook things that are not comfortable cooking. Mm. This is a book that puts these people at ease. You know, they t it takes your hand, it shows you, it tells you which one are the make ahead if you're the make ahead kind of person, which are the half an hour if yeah. you're a half an hour yeah. kind of person. Those are the, the people. So really, it's, yeah. this is dedicated to your I mean, I'll say, quite a lot of pressure to be Yota and Ottolenghi's sister. I mean, you know, <laughs> one would assume you come around for dinner, you know, and I should really expect some, some, some quite good food. Yeah. So I kind of understand that. Um, so, a question here from Lisa Lulabel. Um, she says, I'm a huge fan. I've got nearly all your books. My question is, with all the amazing salads that you've created in the test kitchen, how do you actually decide what you release to the public when you've got so many choices? Yeah. Uh, so, um, essentially, the, the recipes that we, we publish... Are, uh, so, you tested... You visited my test kitchen. There's a bunch of people, normally there's three or four of us, working together on testing recipes. And they have to... You know, they have to pass across a certain bar which is quite um, high in terms of of the flavors that we're up up for so you know things can be good adequately good sorry but not exciting and I want always to have that kind of level of excitement mm. that um, that you get when you eat something for the first time and you go wow so there's mm. this bit of surprise I mean, like, I've had that before, but I don't know exactly what it is, but it's still delicious. So it has to have that kind of complexity mm. and surprise. So once we've cooked something like this, for instance, the chili fish, we, also, we all kind of hang, you know, get together around the pot yeah. and try. And we ask ourselves this question. I mean, how exciting it is. What's the, how much surprise is there in this dish? Do, will people go like, oh, that's okay, but it's not the best thing I had in the world? Uh, so it has to have all these layers. And, uh, and that's what I'm looking for. And I've got a test. So do you keep repeating? Do you, do you come back to dishes? Do you come take this dish and you kind of go, okay, let's try it again. Let's keep evolving. Absolutely. And sometimes, sometimes, Oli, we would test a dish, you know, 12 times until we get it just right. And then once it's passed the test kitchen test, there's a, there's a girl in Wales who tests all, all my recipes on her family. Oh, really? And yeah, oh yeah, she's got three kids. She's got a very lucky family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids, her kids are great eaters. She's got three kids, uh, a husband and her parents-in-law and the great, you know, the extended family don't, don't live too far away. So they always get really well fed. And she's tested every recipe that I've ever published. Wow. And, um, and she, always, she always writes a report. She says, you know, this is how it went. This took five minutes and not three, like you said. I couldn't get... Yeah. You know, I couldn't get preserved lemons in Cardiff or, you know, it's like yeah, yeah. it's all these questions. And, I'm, I, you know, people think, oh, you, he doesn't care about, you know, how, how easy it is or that difficult it is to find ingredients. But I really do. So I always offer alternatives to things that are hard to get. I think it's one of the things we're really lucky about in this country is actually I think that what is now available has totally changed. Totally since, changed. Since, you know, you probably did your first cookbook. I mean, anyway, I'm going to keep going. So, Go for um, it. So Amanda Tolland says she loves your recipes I mean, using your books ever since the first one was published. As autumn is upon us, which of your recipes do you think work particularly well using seasonal game? Do you ever use game on your menu? I, we do use sometimes. We don't use a lot of game, uh, but uh, at the moment, I think, you know, slow cooking pumpkin is really good. You, you get the sweetness. Uh, it's really, really good with game. So 
I think those are the vegetables of the, of, you know, the winter vegetables. Also, cabbage. So at the moment, we've um, in Rovi, I've got a restaurant yep. Rovi that has opened um, not too long ago, a few, couple of months ago, and we have a wonderful dish uh, where we take a whole uh, red cabbage yep. and we throw it in the fire in the embers and let it just do its thing, really almost yeah, just like that. And once it's really cooked for a very long time and very slowly, we peel out the outer. Uh, you know, burnt bits, and we cut it, and we serve it with uh, gorgonzola and grapes, and it's got that kind of intensity, and that would be would work really well with with game, yeah, something like that, red cabbage, Excellent. pumpkins. Very good. Okay, so I've got a question um, from Julius Gapper, which Julius Gapper, which I think answers me. It's one of the things we've been talking about, which is. Where in London do you go, you know, for your sort of lesser known fresh ingredients? I mean, yeah. what's your sort of... So I'm kind of a big fan of the, of the Edgware Road yep. in West London, where you could find many shops that sell uh, Middle Eastern ingredients. Yep. Uh, and I, so I go there and I can find the stuff that I really, really love. Uh, but, you know, like, like tahini, we were talking earlier about tahini. I think um, you really, for, with tahini, you want a really good... Middle Eastern tahini. I like mm -hmm. the ones that are from Lebanon yeah. or, or Palestinian tahinis or Israeli tahinis. They are really, really good and toasty and it's very, very important. People don't understand that with tahini, it's a bit like olive oil. There's good varieties and not such good varieties. So you really want to go for the ones that, uh, that are really, the, toast, the sesame seeds have been toasted properly yeah. and have that kind of nutty. It's like um, if you have a really good peanut butter, yeah, you know the difference. You know the difference, yeah. but uh, you know, but this is kind of more important because this figures figures in every, almost every Middle yeah. East, well, so many Middle Eastern recipes. It's like a, it's it's a basic ingredient. Because that's one of the tricks, isn't it? Which is which which ingredients do you actually invest your time in making from scratch? Yeah. You know, versus ones that you can you can store by. Yeah. Well, I think I think I'm I'm a big fan of buying things that are good yep. you know that ingredients that are good so certain spices you know like za'atar which is one of the spices that i use a lot and in the book i've got a list of 10 uh ingredients that i say okay well i had to narrow down the number of yeah. ingredients i've i recommend using and i took it down to 10 which is pretty difficult and if if you buy this book and you get those 10 ingredients, you kind of sign a contract to buy those 10 ingredients, yeah. they'll take you a long way mm -hmm. in the book. Zatar is one of them, yeah. um, sumac is another, but also preserved lemon, bla black garlic, yeah. uh, ground cardamom. So ingredients that I love using, and they're kind of, they're full of flavor, they do mm -hmm. half the work for you because they're just so intense. And, uh, and those are the ingredients that I, I recommend using, but you want to get really good quality. And once you buy them, you can go quite a lot, Keep quite far with them, yeah. Excellent. Um, so here's a question from David Walker. Hi, Yotam. I first became Hello. aware of your food during your appearance on Australian MasterChef last year. Yotam Week, I believe it was called. Yeah, it was. It's a standout was. thing. We loved your tutelage and passionate and encouraging presence. Thank you. A number of people actually in the group have asked about this. Um, so the question is, is there ever going to be a Yotam Otolenghi cook school? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I spent... Um, Cookery, I love teaching people how to cook, and I did quite a lot of it in, in collaboration with uh, Leith's mm. Cookery School in London. Um, and uh, I used to actually do Saturday classes at least once a month, once every couple of weeks. But I do less of it now because I'm just too busy. One day, I think, like, when I'm a bit older and I've got a bit less to do, I might start a cookery school and spend all day, you know, showing people what to do. But not, nothing imminent, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay, well, there you go. So the answer is... The answer is um, you need to okay, wait. You just have to keep buying the cookbooks, watching these appearances when, when your time is, is, is on air and, and uh, looking out for the next MasterChef, maybe, that is experience. A good, um, um, so this is a question I really am looking forward to the answer to. So Janet um, Vertley has said, if you go out for dinner in London and don't go to your own restaurant, yeah. the caveat, or your network of restaurants, yeah? <laughs> um, where do you go and why? Ah, well, I try to go to places that do, um, I don't, I do, I'm not, because I s I'm surrounded by restaurants, I try to go to places that are kind of less restauranty than the ones that I'm familiar with. So I do love going to, um, uh, again, on the e Lebanese eateries on the Edgware Road are really, yeah. really great, where I can get a good plate of hummus and falafel yeah, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah, of remind yeah. me of, of my childhood, but I look also love going to <coughs> simple tapas bars if I can find them. Uh, the more fancy ones, I mean, talking about tapas bar, I really love Sabor yep. uh, that has opened earlier in the year uh, in central London. A great, 
you know, a great Spanish restaurant that really does the whole, the whole Spanish thing so beautiful. I don't know if you've been there, but it's, 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 it's wonderful. So I, at the fancy restaurants, I go less and less because I've just, I've, I've kind of, I just want to go over and grab things from, some, from different cultures that I can taste and go, okay, that would work for me. Yeah. Also, taking two small children to fancy restaurants is a complete... Disaster. <laughs> Absolute disaster. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, so, Sophie Russian-Smith, who has done an amazing job, as usual, this month. Cooking oh, my God. Sophie is um, just like, she is incredible. She came to my... Um, my talk with Felicity Cloak in yep. Islington a couple of weeks ago, and we just and ever <laughs> since I mean she's done it before as well. She's been like the the top you know the yeah. teacher's pet on Instagram in terms of the quality of the <laughs> images that she, she's produced. It's incredible. Amazing. Yeah, I want to I want to be around Sophie's house. Dinner there every day. Yeah, I mean she like should she <laughs> should work in this. Yeah, if you want to go to a restaurant, so, so, so if you're looking, so looking for a job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, she says um, I wonder now having young children has that influenced the way you cook at home? Um, um, by the way, the fish is almost ready. Right. So essentially, I don't know if you've noticed because they haven't. We haven't been paying much attention Which to that. Been, it's been yeah, that shows how simple. It yeah, is, but the, yeah, exactly. But the, you know, the tomatoes have cooked themselves down. Um, uh, if I had more time, I may have lifted the fish out and reduced it a little more. Yeah. More, but it's absolutely fine to eat, and I love serving it from the pot like yeah. that. So in a in a minute, I'll just let it. I'll turn it off now. In a minute, I'll put the um, tahini. So whether oh, wait, do you let, if you were serving this and you take it off the heat, would you let it rest for a little bit? Before uh, you no, out? not so much. No, this should kind of be served now. Right. It it cooks in about ten to twelve minutes. Yeah. You take, you know, it's like fillets of, of white fish. They don't take very long to cook, uh, but everything else can be done. You have the sauce ready, all reduced and beautiful. You put the fish inside, and as soon as you're ready to to serve, you put it on. You heat it up. You put the fish in. After twelve minutes, you've got the dish ready. You just need to put the tahini on top. Shall I do that quickly before yeah, I answer? Let, let's do yeah, it. so and then the, we can answer some yeah, questions. well, uh, a question about children. So this is a really this is the best thing. So you just you know drizzle it with ton and ton of that tahini, which is essentially tahini paste, um, lemon juice, water, and then some more of those toasted caraway seeds, which are really marvelous with tomato, and some coriander. Uh, you don't need much to get nice flavor that's kind of it really you can drizzle it with a tiny bit of oil if you want but that's it shall I, can you see it do you think the people can actually see it yeah to bring it yeah i'll bring it over closer take, take to the, the camera book out of the way there we go yeah here we go ah i mean i know it's you cooking it but that looked pretty simple it is, yeah, yeah. yeah it is. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Few <laughs> ingredients, but you know. Anyway, we, so we had the question from Sophie yeah. about um, you. You know, you have kids now. How's that changed the way you cook? Has it changed the way you cook? Um, it well, it, in a sense, I've. You know, when I had children, before I had children, I thought I'm, I was really clever. I said, like, my kids will eat whatever I eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're going to we sit there. We say, yeah, we sit there at the table. I'll show them good food, and they, but it, it doesn't work that way. Kids have a completely different palate. And so you do cook for them things that they, you know, they would are more likely to like. But it's it's a great challenge, and I find myself. Uh, this is a different palette. What do you what what what, so what you, you discover? You like? know, for instance, yeah. Well, I mean, you've got young kids. Yeah. We've got kids of similar ages. I mean, I find that um, they are there. Have got some kind of obsession about green things. Like my kids would not if it's chopped up like parsley and coriander and things they wouldn't have it but if it's not really it doesn't stand out so if it's like a bulk of something like they would eat broccoli yep. uh, or some it, as long as it doesn't have the things that stick out you know they've right. got there's this kind of purism that yeah, kids yeah. have i don't know what it is as in the old uh, random green leaf yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's like, like get dirty off. get that out so we have to pick <laughs> that and i used to really get angry about that i go what are you talking about it's delicious but actually i can you know i just know how it works yeah. for them so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that I, I you know, so I go with what they like. So for instance, some one thing I didn't think they they would love like, but they love is lentils. There's some they like lentil soups, yeah. and they like any kind of lentils. So you know I do a lot of that kind of business of rice, lentils, fried onion, majadra, which is a great um, you know Arabic dish. 
and I make it and I make a huge bowl and, and they absolutely love it. Uh, on the other hand, they wouldn't touch a lettuce, you know, or a tomato, fresh tomatoes. They yeah, like yeah, tomato sauce, but they don't like tomatoes. It's really it's weird. It's really odd, isn't it? Yeah. I was very proud. My son actually ate um, lamb's heart on, on Saturday. Did he really? Was like, he was like, That's a world he was record. Like, I was like, come on, it was, you know, here's a lamb's heart. And he's like, okay, yeah, let's try it. And, and what like, did wow. he say? He loved it. He said, can I have more? So I'm like, you know, it'll last a week, then he'll yeah, stop eating. Yeah, yeah, no. You, I've, my, my you get those moments yeah. where they actually kind of, you know, yeah. They, they surprise you, oh, yeah. but, it's, but it's rare, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think what the last, last question here is, which is, so, you know, you've been a major impact, I think, on the London food scene and clearly way beyond with your books and stuff. And a number of chefs have come through your restaurants. Yes. And, um, you know, I think it's one of the things when I talk to chefs about, you know, what they're most proud of in some ways, one of the things they often talk about is the, the legacy they hope to create in training people up yeah. and stuff. And one of the people in the group, um, Chris Tindale, asked about Josh Katz, um, who came to your restaurants and was going to do things. So Berber, really, Berber, Josh of Berber and Q. Yeah, so I mean, what, do you, you know, what, what do you look for in the chefs you create, you know, you, that come through you and, and some, some of the ones you're most proud of? Yeah, well, I'm very proud of Josh because, it, first of all, he's a terrific guy. He's just the nicest person and has been always like when he worked for me, but when he left, I mean, he's always been really a great friend and person to have around. Scully, who's run yeah. uh, Nopi and now he's got his own restaurant, Scully, and, you know, a bunch of other people, many of them, um, I can't even, you know, think of now. But uh, for me, you know, the, like I said, when you asked me about inspiration, I said, you know, it's, it's the people around me that inspire me. And when they go, it's essentially, they just spend some time, and then they move on and do their stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that I, I guess I do teach them something, but it's like I th there's something about the critical way in which we do. Uh, I don't teach them how to cook because they mm -hmm. come as very good cooks often, and then and they leave as very good cooks. But it's the conversations that we have around mm -hmm. food, like how much can do you, do you actually put in a dish? I mean, young chefs tend to sometimes overdo it. You know, mm -hmm. there's too many things. I think I used to be like that a bit before Simple. But, yeah. uh, you know, that idea that you could just load and load and load, but yeah. actually you forget what you're having. So you forget what is the main ingredient mm -hmm. on the plate. Um, so I, I think these people that come in, they, you know, they spend time when we taste together. And I think this is the most the most important thing that we do is taste, yeah. taste and, ha and have conversations. Uh, so I'm super proud of them and I'm very happy to hear of all the restaurants and places that opened that are from, from our prodigies and you know they're doing great. I'm very proud, very excellent. happy. Excellent. Well look, um, I think we should try this because actually we've, we've, oh, we've go for it. Let's this out here. We haven't, we've let it sit. Yeah. So that wasn't, you know, have you got, totally I'll, I'll grab, a, I'll grab a, a spoon and tell me what you think. I've got one here. Mm. That's delicious. The teeny really works, doesn't it? Mmm. Mm. Thank you. That's a really simple dish. I mean, I think this is, you know, look, I, I, I admit that I think we've all had the Yotamotelenki moment where we're like, yes, I'd forgotten to look in detail at the, at the ingredients <laughs> list, but actually, I think, you know, if you look at what's on this list, pretty much everything, obviously apart from the halibut, you have actually in your yeah. store cupboard. Yeah, no, and then you can use any white fish that you, yeah. you know, that you happen to have. And, it, and the sauce itself is a really good solid tomato it's sauce. Good you can, you can use well, Yeah, enjoying the Very heat. Very nice. Very nice heat. Very nice heat. Listen, Yossam, thank you, thank so, you so much, much for joining us thank today. Thank you, Oli. Um, thank you guys for all the questions you asked. Really, really appreciate it. And as we know, in the Cookbook Club, if you haven't joined the Great British Chefs Cookbook Club, the, the idea is really simple. Every month we pick a cookbook and a community of about 4,000 people cook all the recipes. Last month was the Great British Chef's Cookbook. This month is the simply titled Simple by Yotamot Lenghi. And um, it's, you know, it's a great book. And if you haven't joined the club, please do join the club. And please join the club. Yeah. And, and, sh and share images. We, we, we love it. It's very exciting. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. And um, see you again soon. Thank you. Brilliant. Very good. <laughs> thank you. Very good.